Hello, I'm Gregory Appling, a member of the Sonoma Land Trust Board of Directors, and I would like to welcome you to the Sonoma Land Trust webinar featuring UC Berkeley PhD candidate Lorenzo Washington. For Sonoma Land Trust Language of the Land presentation, a peek into the World Wide Web, how plants and fungi communicate underground. We will explore the relationship between trees, other plants and fungi that hinge on cooperation instead of competition to improve their odds of survival. Located in soil everywhere, these extensive underground communication networks play crucial roles within ecosystems and can provide new strategies for agricultural cultivation. At the end of the presentation, we will feature a short interview session. If you would like to submit questions, please use the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen at any time during the presentation or during the interview session. The Sonoma Land Trust was founded in 1976. Our mission is to protect the scenic, natural, agricultural, and open landscapes of Sonoma County for the benefit of the community and future generations. To date, we have protected over 50,000 acres. Lorenzo Washington is a PhD candidate in Dr. Henrik Schiller's lab at the Plant and Microbial Biology Department of UC Berkeley receiving his BS in Bioenvironmental Science from Texas A&M in 2018. Lorenzo studies how the plant cell wall and membrane influence the establishment and regulation of relationships with beneficial microbes in the root system. Progress in this research area can help illuminate the complex world of multi mutualistic plant microbial relationships, shift our understanding of plant life to a community focus, and potentially introducing new sustainable solutions to modern agriculture. Always having a passion for the sciences, but rarely seeing a face like his doing any of it inspires Lorenzo's commitment to outreach and science education. He hopes this effort can help bridge the divide that has formed between the sciences and the public as well as engender his same passion and other people from historically excluded backgrounds. Ladies and gentlemen, Lorenzo Washington's presentation, a peek into the wood wide web, how plants and fungi communicate underground. Thank you for the introduction, Gregory. Let me just get my screen set up. All right. Sorry about that. So, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming to the talk. And I'd just like to start out by giving us a little bit of a walk through the woods, if you will. If you've ever gone on a hike through a forest, you're probably familiar with the whisper of the wind breezing through the canopy or the distant singing of the birds. It can be quite peaceful just sitting in the shade as the sounds of the forest make their way through the maze of trees and undergrowth. Many folk enjoy forest for this reason. It's a nice respite from the hustle and bustle we're usually engaged in or surrounded by. But for the plants surrounding you, this is just as busy of a place as the city would be for us. Trees are gunning for precious unfiltered light at the canopy. All sorts of pests and pathogens are looking for a suitable host to stick up. And roots are tirelessly exploring the soil for water and essential nutrients. So how do plants manage all of this? I can barely figure out how to survive when I was growing up and then again when I moved out to California. And that was with the benefit of being able to move around and talk with my neighbors and friends. These plants are just stuck here, silently standing amongst a crowd. At least, that's what I used to think. Until I learned to look a little more closely below ground. You see, plants might not be able to talk, but they can communicate, negotiate even in many different ways. As and they worked out a sweet deal with some friendly fungi to make sure their roots aren't always tirelessly toiling away. These fungi grow into their host roots and can expand out through the soil, finding resources and more hosts along the way. Eventually building up to networks that can be found on every continent on earth with the exception of Antarctica. This ancient agreement between kingdoms of life alleviates the burden of resource gathering for plants, can let plants speak directly to each other, and is quickly being understood as a cornerstone of our environment. Today, we'll be discussing this ancient friendship as we take 
a peek into the wood wide web. Now, before we get into this talk, I would like to acknowledge that my living and workspace is on Huichun, unceded Lijun Alone land in the East Bay. And I also want to remind folks that you can enter questions into the Q&A as we go, and they will be addressed at the end of the presentation. I look forward to all the wonderful questions you might have. And a little overview of what I'm going to be discussing. I will talk about the what the Wood Wide Web actually is, followed by how it fits into the ecosystem and what roles it performs and how that knowledge can help us. So without further ado, what is the Wood Wide Web? So they, this is actually a collection of underground fungal networks that connects to various plants in an ecosystem. And it's not restricted to the woods. Most plants on land can actually form these relationships and be incorporated into such networks. Uh, wood wide web is just too catchy of an analogy to not use. <laughs> and so what kind of fungi are making these relationships? If you're like me, before I started studying this, the first thing that comes to mind might be uh, the kind of fungi we associate with degrading. They're either growing on uh, fallen logs in the forest or maybe that piece of fruit that you left out on the counter at the bottom of the bowl for a week too long. However, the kinds of fungi that are making up uh, these networks are actually mycorrhizal fungi. So they're more like traders. Uh, and this trading approach is demonstrated by the image there on the bottom left where the fungus is going out and acquiring these mineral nutrients for the plant. And in exchange for this service, plants are essentially paying the fungi with sugars and other fats uh, or photosynthetic products um, for these nutrients. Now, uh, mycorrhizal is a word I'm gonna be saying a lot for the rest of this presentation. So I do just wanna break down what that means exactly. It is Latin and it quite literally means fungus root, which I think is a very effective and wonderful name. And uh, the image there on the right shows you what this kind of looks like underground. Uh, the fungus is literally kind of growing out from these roots uh, and into the soil. Now, there are many types of mycorrhizal fungi, but they can generally be classified into two groups, endo and ecto. Now, these two types can differ quite a bit in their behavior and genetics, but follow the same unifying principle, which is they associate internally with the roots of a host in order to exchange resources. And they actually require this process to complete their life cycle. So they are obligate uh, symbiotes. And a little bit of a difference between the endo and ecto before I go into more detail. Endomycorrhizae, as the uh, image so kindly demonstrates, do penetrate uh, root cells. So they actually do go inside of uh, root cell walls and into the interior of a cell um, as part of their relationship. Ectomycorrhizae, as their name implies, uh, do not. They only stay outside of cells. So they grow in thick mats on the surface and grow down between root cells, staying outside of their cell walls. So I'm going to go uh, into a little more detail about these, and I'll first talk about uh, the most common type of endomycorrhizae, which we call arbuscular mycorrhizae, or AM for short, because arbuscular mycorrhizae is a bit of a mouthful <laughs> for everyday talk. And this is the most common type of endomycorrhizae, with about 80% or more of plant species found on land capable of forming the symbiosis, which means if you're looking at a plant, there's a pretty good chance that it has the ability to form this relationship. And both fossil and genetic evidence suggests that this process is over 400 million years old. That's like so old, this is before plants even had roots. Like roots were not a thing yet. Plants were still in the process of uh, coming out of the seas onto land. And you know we have evidence that this is actually, at this time, they were still able to form these relationships with fungi that were remarkably similar um, to what we see today. Now, the defining feature of this relationship is the formation of the arbuscule, uh, named as such because it looks a little like a tree from the right angle, and storage structures called vesicles, and they form these inside of root cells. So you may be wondering what the images on uh, the right are, and those are actually of arbuscules. So these are, these are images that I took earlier this year at my lab, and all of the glowing green parts you see are the fungus itself. 
And these are growing inside of a, a grass species. These are root sections that I've stained. Um, and the arbuscule, if I can find my little spotlight, there we are, is this structure right here. Um, it's an extremely branched structure, and you can see the hyphae that are growing in between the root cells. And you can see that these form all along the length of the root. And what you don't see in this because of the staining process is these hyphae also extend out into the soil where they go to recover those resources and connect with other plant hosts. A, another important feature of the uh, of AM are that they actually do not form mushrooms, which can seem a bit counterintuitive because I know, especially before I was studying this, I also, when I think of fungi, immediately think of mushrooms, uh, but these fungi do not form mushrooms. Uh, instead, they directly produce spores that remain in the soil and can become airborne uh, if that soil is disturbed. So, Something you might be wondering is how does the plant form such a close relationship without letting all sorts of pathogens in or cause some other problem for the plant? Uh, and the answer is, well, really careful communication and lots of boundary setting. I mean, there's a whole fungus growing inside of a root cell, right? Like that's not an easy process to accomplish, but it turns out a few hundred million years of evolution works out a nice uh, conversation between host and symbiote. So this conversation starts out well before uh, the fungus and plant actually make physical contact. They send out chemical signals into the soil, and this usually happens when the plant is low on critical nutrients. And this lets each other know that they are looking for a little bit of companionship. And then after detecting these signals and eventually making physical contact, so the fungus comes up onto the root surface, they get to know each other a little more closely. And there's a little more signaling that occurs between them to let the plant know that this is a friendly encounter. And as a result, the soon-to-be plant host suppresses its immune response and begins to make a special membrane for the fungus to go inside. If you're looking at the image on the left, this membrane is indicated by the PPA tag in the middle uh, bubble. Now, once this membrane is formed, uh, it's a boundary that the fungus respects greatly because it has to for the plant to keep it inside. Uh, this membrane allows the fungus to grow in the space between cells without causing any issues for the plant. And at some point, the fungus decides that it's time to form its trading structure, that arbuscule that I mentioned earlier. And once it does that, uh, some more signals occur and it actually enters the root cell, like it shows in the third bubble, to form that arbuscule. The caveat being, it is still engulfed in that special membrane. So technically speaking, it's not inside the cell. Uh, and that cell also has to undergo extensive rearrangement to accommodate this new inhabitant. Now, once that arbuscule is made, they have to, the fungus and the plant have to prove to each other that they can be counted on. So there's some resource exchange that goes back and forth. And during this process, both the plant and the fungus are monitoring the situation. They're taking note of how much nutrients they're trading and how much sugars they're getting back or vice versa. Also, hmm, maybe I don't need this. Maybe something else in my network is giving me what I need and this isn't for me right now. And through this process of monitoring, they can decide that they want to part ways and the arbuscule can degrade and the fungus can leave the root, whether by choice or by force of the plant host uh, and move on to other things. However, they can also decide that this is a mutually beneficial relationship. And the arbuscule will still actually degrade it after a few days, but the fungus will grow to new parts of the root um, and continue on with this relationship. Now, many arbuscules, so many of those little trading structures, can be made at any given time in the root, and they will continue to be made and degraded until the two decide to part ways. This can be happening um, with multiple fungal partners in a single plant host at one time, as well as with multiple plant hosts for a single fungal partner at the same time. So you can already get an idea of just how quick and expansive these networks can form uh, with that in mind. I will be talking about that more later though. And just a, a brief recap of all that information about our buscular mycorrhizae. These are the most common endomycorrhizal relationship. They're extremely common among land plants of all types, 
and grow into and along host groups to form temporary trading, uh, trading structures and storage structures. I like to think of them a bit like farmer's markets. They show up, set up shop, give out their resources in exchange for uh, compensation, tear down and build up somewhere else. And you can see in the image on the left that uh, a much, uh, much more descriptive of just how extensive uh, this arbuscule formation can be. It's occurring all along the route. There are many arbuscules at a given time. Um, and yeah, I, I just, I, I love looking at these images because it kind of blows my mind just how much of the route can be dedicated um, to this exchange. Um, it's, it's really remarkable just how much space uh, these, this fungus can take up inside of its host. And moving on to the other uh, very common type of mycorrhizal relationship, ectomycorrhizae. Uh, now these form with comparatively relatively few plant species, only about 2%. However, these are trees and other woody plants that tend to dominate forest and woodland habitats in temperate or boreal climates. So uh, these are actually what we think of, what most people I feel think of when we talk about the wood white web. Um, these are ones that are forming associations with pine trees, eucalyptus trees, um, and all up and down in like the, uh, the taiga and whatnot. Now, this relationship actually evolved independently from arbuscular mycorrhizae at some point and multiple times. The oldest definitive fossils uh, that show this relationship date back to about 50 million years old. So not as old as uh, arbuscular mycorrhizae, but definitely still up there. And these produce frequently delicious mushrooms as part of their life cycle. Uh, for you mushroom fans out there, the types of fungi that usually form these ectomycorrhizal relationships are either basidio or ascomycetes. And uh, you know, another defining feature aside from this wonderful mushroom production is also the formation of the mantle, as you can see in the bottom right image. Uh, where a mat of hyphae grow over the exterior of the root and then penetrate between the cells and go off into the rest of the soil. The image on the left is actually a great example of uh, a mantle forming. And you can see the, if I can get my spotlight back. Here we go. You can see the uh, root itself is actually running along here uh, on the bottom. And then all the white you see is actually, in this case, Amanita muscaria, so the red cap mushroom with the white dots that some of you might be familiar with, um, coating the exterior of these branched roots. And this is the mushroom, and uh, you can kind of already see little uh, filaments that are gonna be extending out into the rest of the soil. And so how does this process occur? Well, pretty similar to the AM process, actually, uh, with a few key differences. So first, they need to have a friendly conversation at a distance, figure out if this uh, relationship might be right for them, and then they get to know each other a little more closely. And this is where we start to see those key differences come up. You know, ectomycorrhizal fungi uh, prefer their physical contact at the tip of the root where they form that mantle structure. The image in the bottom right is showing you a, a budding uh, root tip um, kind of already being coated by all the... Uh, the mycelium of this ectomycorrhizal species. And you know, once they make this contact, once they coat the root tips, they then begin to grow into or between uh, the plant cells in the root. And you know, so they are kind of respecting each other's boundaries a little bit more in, in some regards than arbuscular mycorrhizae might. And then they still do need to prove that they can be counted on. Uh, and if they go and trade resources and there are signals also from the plant, there is still the monitoring process as well. The difference in this case being that they don't break down these mantle structures after a few days and move on to a new part of the root. These actually tend to stick around for quite a long time. Um, and I'm not sure at the exact length of these things, but uh, you can consider it a fairly like semi-permanent process as long as they both agree to the relationship. And uh, we also do see uh, at this point a bit of a pickier tendency with ectomycorrhizae. Simply because of how they came about, uh, there's a wider diversity of species that can, are capable of forming this relationship. And we also see a uh, much more particular uh, focus on host species for different mycorrhizae, ectomycorrhizal species. And so to recap all of that, uh, 
Ectomycorrhizae associate with many of the trees and woody plants found in temperate and boreal forest. They prefer to grow around root tips and between the cells to form a long-term trading interface. So I like to think of them a bit like a grocery store, right? Endomycorrhizae, they form the arbuscules, they break down a few days, farmer's market. These, they stick around, they find a nice spot, they set up shop, and they'll trade resources for a very long time. So a lot more like your favorite grocery store. And also many popular mushrooms are from ectomycorrhizae. Uh, we can thank ectomycorrhizae for truffles, chanterelles, morels, matsutake mushrooms, Amanita muscaria mushrooms. Some really big fan favorites uh, are ectomycorrhizae, which also explains why we usually only get them through foraging. Uh, this is a pretty hard relationship to kind of recreate in a farming context at least to date. And so now I've talked a lot about what makes the World Wide Web physically. But equally as interesting and exciting in my opinion is what it does for the ecosystem. So how are these plant fungal relationships impacting the environment around them? So at its core, they extend root systems by trading resources like essential nutrients such as uh, phosphorus and nitrogen as well as providing water to their hosts. And these are resources the plant likely wouldn't able, be able to access otherwise. Uh, mycorrhizal mycelium can end up extending to like a thousand plus times longer than a host root can. They're much smaller, they can reach different pockets of the soil that plant roots would not be able to. And they also do this in a much more efficient way than growing roots would require for the plant. And uh, the interesting part about this nutrient provision is that some estimates have shown that host plants can provide upwards of like 10 to 20% of their own sugar and fats that they produce to their fungal partners. Like a fifth of all the energy that they put into making food goes into feeding these fungi, who in turn have the potential to provide the majority of the host's phosphorus and nitrogen. Like I think it's 60 to 80%, depending on the uh, situation. And these are ideal estimates, but still. And also there was a uh, paper that came out about a week ago from a Berkeley lab who showed uh, direct evidence of water transfer between mycorrhizae and tree. And in the greenhouse setting that they did it, they showed the mycorrhizae can end up being responsible for somewhere around 40% of the plant's water uptake, which is, in my opinion, a pretty astonishingly high number. Um, and also this whole time I've been using the word trading, nutrient trading, right? They're trading these resources for the sugars. And that's a very intentional use of the word because the fungi and the plant can both alter how much the cost of their services should be in similar fashion to how humans can change the cost of our food for various reasons, right? A uh, mycorrhizae might be like, yo, look, I got all of that nutrients for you somewhere over that hill, you know, it was a really long trip, took me a lot of effort, that's going to cost you 30 sugars. And the tree could be like, I don't know, man, it's been a hard week, sun hasn't been shining much, 30 sugars feels like a lot. How about 20, 25? Ideal, 25. That might be a bit cheesy, but there is a sort of kind of barter trade uh, situation, if you will. Um, some prominent researchers have even likened the uh, wood wide web at, to a stock market of sorts, where fungi kind of can control the, the cost of their nutrients based on supply and demand and, and where they're pulling um, these nutrients from. Now, as you might expect, this alone, this trading of nutrients, can have many larger effects on the ecosystem, such as providing an edge uh, to plants with better networks, or making living in less than ideal conditions possible for plants, especially young ones. But there are many other ways these fungal networks exercise their influence. And I like to talk about them under the um, umbrella of enabling community action. So with these mycorrhizal networks, we do see a sharing of resources between plants, um, trees especially. So things like sugars and other nutrients, as well as signaling and defense compounds. And there's some pretty astonishing examples of this. There have been um, experimental evidence of preferential resource sharing between related trees. So as the image suggests, mother trees who are much taller can reach prime light in the canopy and produce an excess of food that they need, can then send this 
through their mycorrhizal networks to their children tree, their baby trees, um, who are, may, might be sitting in the shade and are not able to produce all the nutrients they need to grow up big and strong in the forest. We can also see this between different species. For example, um, a birch tree and a pine tree near each other, right? During the winter or the summer, they have different conditions. The birch tree in the summer is full of leaves, maybe crowding out the pine tree, and the pine tree is having a harder time competing with all the deciduous trees around it. And the winter, the pine tree is doing great, right? Has all its leaves, it's an evergreen. And in contrast, the birch maybe is a little cold, right? All its leaves are gone. It doesn't, uh, is not able to produce the same amount of resources. And in these conditions, we can see preferential sharing where in the winter, the pine tree could be giving sugars uh, and other nutrients to the birch tree. And in return, in the summertime, the birch tree can give nutrients back to the pine tree, essentially creating a more stable environment for both partners and ensuring survival for either, regardless of their situation. We can also see this resource sharing uh, for trees that are suffering from infestations. So trees that might be sick for whatever reason, an in, uh, infection, or maybe they're just getting old and are not able to um, uh, not able to collect uh, re or provide resources for themselves as they could anymore. They can take up resources from their mycorrhizal network to make sure that they can make it through the arduous times. And speaking of arduous times, examples of the signaling and defense compounds. Uh, have already shown uh, experimental evidence of sharing early warning messages for pest and pathogen infection or infections and infestations. Um, so a tree that has a beetle infect, uh, infestation, for example, um, can send its signals down through the mycorrhizal network to the surrounding trees to let them know that maybe they should turn on their immune system uh, or prime their immune system response to be ready for a potential infection. Now, trees normally do send these signals out through the air. They're airborne, but can be a bit spotty uh, kind of distribution, right? It's much more dependent on the wind. Where it gets to is less sure. But by sending it out to the mycorrhizal networks, it's kind of like a direct line to their friends to let them know that they should be worried about potential trouble in the future. And these fungal networks also can increase resistance to toxic conditions. Uh, mycorrhizal fungi have the ability, uh, like many other fungi, to accumulate heavy metals and salts uh, into their own tissues. And this uh, essentially kind of remediates land uh, and allows plants to grow relatively unimpacted in situations that would actually normally be toxic to them. And you know, also with mycorrhizal relationships, we've seen uh, an improved immune system in their plant hosts. So this, of course, can come from just the better nutrition that we see but also simply the association with mycorrhizae, prime the immune system for faster and more effective action. So the, this analogy isn't maybe the best because of how plant immune systems are different from animal immune systems, but you can kind of think about it as like a universal vaccine, getting the immune system ready for any sort of action that it might face. And another way that mycorrhizae are very important uh, for their ecosystems is through improving soil health and creating niches for other uh, creatures and organisms to fill. So the presence of mycorrhizae by itself benefits soil health directly by improving soil aggregation through uh, the excretion of certain compounds like uh, glomulin. Now, we don't really know the exact mode of action that uh, is responsible for this. We just know it does it. There's more research going on uh, to answer that question. Um, and another way that they can, can improve soil aggregation and soil structure is by ushering in larger and longer lasting root systems by providing healthier plants and a more stable environment for plants to grow in. Now, indirectly, they can create extensive interfaces for other soil microbes to move around on in the soil. Now, this video that you should be seeing right now uh, is actually a demonstration of bacteria moving along uh, the water streams that are stuck to the outside of hyphae. And so you can think of this kind of like a highway or maybe like the bridges or BART in the Bay Area um, because bacteria require a liquid environment to move, right? It's very hard for these small creatures to make it through air pockets in the soil. Uh, this gives them a fast track to move to the soil and get to different organisms or different nutrient pockets uh, and ends up kind of mixing the soil in a sense and creating a more heterogeneous environment 
where carbon and other nutrients are moving uh, more quickly and more effectively throughout the soil to a much faster and to a much greater extent, which ultimately improves the soil community and the health of the, the soil that the community is in. Now, these fungi also need help uh, in some regards, such as making the resources they trade uh, available for uptake, because unlike their cousins, right, they've kind of given up on the lifestyle of the degrader and the recycler. So there are some types of bacteria that can actually make those nutrients from like leaf litter or other degrading material more available for the fungi to take up. They also, fungi also see benefits in the presence of some bacteria in other regards, like improving general fungal growth, the degree to which they can associate with plant partners, and also keeping the host fungus from getting infected by other microorganisms. Uh, and this whole field of mycorrhizal helper bacteria, as some people uh, have started to call them, is uh, kind of new. I think it's something we've really only broached in the last 20 years. And, uh, new technologies have made it much more interesting to study. Uh, and it's something that I'm very excited to see more research come out about. And on a bit of a larger scale, uh, as far as niche creation, we also see plants that have taken a bit of a different approach to utilizing these networks. And we call them mycoheterotrophs. So mycoheterotrophs, literally fungus eaters <laughs> in some sense, are plants that entirely depend upon the mycorrhizal networks for energy. So they've actually lost the ability to photosynthesize and as such can take on striking colors like the red and the white you see here. And these two uh, species of mycoheterotrophs are on the left known as snow plant. Uh, John Muir described them as a pillar of fire uh, when he was coming through the Sierras. These are ones you can actually see if you go out hiking, I believe it's like early spring uh, in the Sierras, especially in Northern California. And on the right, we have the ghost pipe, uh, monotropa species. Um, you see this a lot on the East Coast. You don't see it so much out on the West Coast. And these mycoheterotrophs, uh, you know, aside from just looking beautiful, uh, kind of create hubs for many different fungi within the network. So their lifestyle isn't strictly parasitic in some sense. They do actually provide a bit of a service for the mycorrhizae living in the soil. They can also indicate that there is a healthy mycorrhizal network in that particular area of the forest because without an extensive mycorrhizal network already, there's not much of a way for these plants to survive. Now, as with anything in life, and especially considering the comparison we like to draw to the internet, there's a wide range of behaviors within the wood wide web. Uh, and a few of these examples of the dark side can be toxins can spread through this fungal network uh, walnut trees, for example, uh, put out a chemical that normally just diffuses through the soil, inhibiting growth of anything in their immediate vicinity. Uh, but researchers demonstrated that these toxins that they produce can actually move through the mycorrhizal network and aggregate around other plants um, at a further distance than they would normally be able to go. Uh, and that's just one example of how toxins can move through. We also do see, uh, you know, this, these host preferences that we can see uh, with mycorrhizae can give invasive species an edge in certain contexts. A great example of this is a eucalyptus tree. So if you've, you know, been in the Bay Area, I know especially, any time in the last 100 years, you might be wondering where all these eucalyptus trees came from. Why are they so hard to get rid of? One of the reasons is their associations with ectomycorrhizae. Uh, their ectomycorrhizal associations are pretty uh, picky. They really only like uh, eucalyptus trees, so much so that uh, early loggers who were trying to make uh, kind of tree plantations for eucalyptus actually had to import soil from their native habitats that contain this mycorrhizal species uh, so they could actually set up these uh, eucalyptus plantations. And once they did, uh, and this mycorrhizae was present in these situations, it was much easier for the eucalyptus to kind of just spread and, and start to take over um, and become a dominant plant in a lot of these ecosystems. And finally, uh, a great example is the fungi can actually exploit these trading dynamics. So I, I talked a bit about how, you know, the, the plant and the fungi can kind of change how much they charge for their services or whatnot. Well, fungi aren't always kind businessmen. <laughs> they can be a bit disingenuous with their pricing. Um, so charging, you know, more than they normally would uh, for providing a service simply because 
whatever reason, um, or even exhibiting uh, favoritism of sorts, where they preferentially provide resources to a few uh, well-to-do trees or other plants that they know they will be getting resources in return from, and kind of bleeding dry other plants they think are maybe not as good of an investment, essentially. Um, and whenever I think about this, uh, I, yeah, it's just, I, I think the stock market references are very appropriate in some senses, and it's a, it's a fascinating part of the mycorrhizal networks that while very difficult to study, um, I think will be very exciting um, in the next few, uh, you know, several years as we really get into this. So I've been talking about all these different examples of what it does, but I don't think it really hammers home the scale um, and the degree to which these networks actually form. So I am showing you a couple of these maps from some uh, studies uh, researchers have done in, I believe, British Columbia. And, um, you know, just to demonstrate how effectively uh, these networks can form because they're able to associate with multiple, like a single fungus can associate with multiple plants or a single plant can associate with multiple fungi. And they quickly build these node-based networks similar to like internet or air travel. So the map you see on the left shows mycorrhizal connections between Douglas firs in a 90 square meter plot. Larger trees have larger icons and uh, different genetic types of mycorrhizal species are represented by differently colored lines. The black dots you see on the map are where the researchers took soil and root samples uh, to actually infer this map. They did a lot of uh, different genetic sequencing strategies to figure out who was associating with who. So a couple of things uh, of note from this are, uh, first off, a single genetic type uh, within this network. So a single color, uh, you can see the blue here actually, or I'm sorry, the red here actually, um, is connecting about a quarter of the trees in and beyond this 90 square meter plot. So that's a, a single genetic type. So essentially what could be one or what could be a couple of genetically identical mycorrhizae are connecting what ends up being about 20 trees. And I think that alone is pretty impressive. But then we go a little further and we realize that over 80% of the trees in the study are connected to another tree. So within this 90 square meter plot that has about 70 trees in it, 80% of those trees have a physical connection through the mycorrhizal network to another tree of at least one degree, just one degree. There could be multiple different degrees of connection. Uh, an example of that being the tree in the bottom right with the arrow pointing to it actually has uh, some degree of connection with 47 other trees over 11 different genetic types of mycorrhizae, uh, which you can see it gets pretty complicated uh, stemming out from that tree. Uh, and I, I think that's pretty wild. Um, and you know this can be a bit busy, but the map on the right, uh, I think demonstrates this kind of network forming principle a little better. Um, it's the same as the map on the left, except the trees are now represented as circles darker green circles being older and larger circles being a larger tree. The fungal lines are now represented as just these black lines. And the thicker the line is, the greater the degree of connection between the trees. Now with this view, it gets a lot more hectic, but also it's, in my opinion, a lot easier to see just how connected and complex these networks can form especially when we have several older trees forming the nodes, the, the core of this network, connecting younger and smaller trees nearby. And I wanna remind you that this network we're seeing uh, in this image on the right is just a 90 by 90 meter plot in the forest, roughly just under half the size of a standard city block. So a pretty small snapshot of what these networks look like for the forest ecosystem at large. Uh, and so, you know, when you really start to kind of, uh, as, oops, there's my thing. When you really start to kind of go further past that, I think it really communicates just the scale of how these networks can build up and form. So these two maps uh, are showing you the predicted uh, mycorrhizal relationships in the forest on earth. And this is just forest land, right? As I mentioned earlier, these relationships can occur with sort of any plant. We see them in grasslands, we see them um, 
excuse me, in pretty much any ecosystem where plants can exist in density. And uh, the top graph on the top left is showing you ectomycorrhizal tree density. And the bottom one is showing you arbuscular mycorrhizal tree density. And uh, the red means they are more dense. The blue means they are predicted to be absent or nearly absent. And as you can see that there are you know, a few key traits here, ectomycorrhizal fungi, as I mentioned, form mostly in temperate or cold regions of the globe. Our muscular mycorrhizal species are most common in the tropics. So Amazon rainforests, the Congo rainforests, or uh, you know, Indonesian rainforests as well. And I really like these maps because they demonstrate just the global reach of these networks, right? So if I go back real quick, this is just a 90 by 90 meter plot. And you can kind of multiply that on a logarithmic scale and you can see just how extensive and complex these networks can potentially build up to. Sending their resources around, um, sending signals around and doing all sorts of things that we're just beginning to figure out. And I, I will say that there are a bit of behavioral differences between um, arbuscular mycorrhizae and ectomycorrhizae we see, such as like differences in how they share resources or how large their networks can be. But ultimately speaking, uh, at the end of the day, you know, they're doing pretty similar things on pretty similar scales. And so just to recap the ecosystem impacts that we see from ectomycorrhizae, or sorry, from the wood wide web and mycorrhizal relationships, it's First, the exchange of resources and information within their networks. So the wood wide web analogy is a pretty good one. All sorts of things ranging from sugars to warning signals are shuttled around underneath our feet without our knowledge between different partners. Uh, new members are being added to the network at any given time. Old members are being taken out of the network and there's all sorts of turnover and cross communication and things going on. And within these networks, we also see an improved uh, survival of seedlings and uh, plants in adverse conditions. And this is also uh, useful to humans uh, understanding this context because we can use this to aid habitat expansion or reclamation for certain critical species and ecosystems. Uh, for example, after you know, a large wildfire coming through, um, it does kill off most things, especially in the top layer of the soil. Unfortunately, that includes mycorrhizal species. And so the introduction of mycorrhizal uh, species that preferentially form host relationships with you know, uh, critical trees that are growing in that area um, can help tree seedlings establish and expedite the process of, uh, of you know, reclaiming that land uh, back to the forest that it once was. And we also do see uh, niche creation and positive impact to soil health um, from these mycorrhizal relationships. All of that mycelium running through the soil can help improve structure, the health of the organisms in it, and as well as creating more spaces for life to inhabit. And also, just like we see with the internet and human behavior, <laughs> the wood wide web can facilitate competitive behavior, both between the, micro, uh, the mycorrhizae involved in it, as well as the plant hosts involved in it. And before I go and kind of finish my talk, I do want to briefly talk about the agricultural application that our understanding uh, can lead to, uh, of these species can lead to. So, you know, modern agriculture or modern industrialized agriculture, especially, has a lot of uh, issues in regards to sustainability and environmental health. And on top of that, uh, unsurprisingly, it also can negatively impact mycorrhizal networks. You know, the typical setup we see at least here in uh, North Americas, you know, of the large monoculture uh, with, without cover crop rotations or with kind of, you know, poorly implemented cover crop rotations, frequent usage of inputs like fertilizers and pesticides. All of these can have drastic impacts on the mycorrhizal communities in the soil on top of their other environmental concerns. You know, these are ecosystems that are pretty removed from their natural context, or at least what used to be their natural context. And all of that makes it difficult for mycorrhizae to, one, even form their relationships, especially in regards to the um, fertilizer that we're applying, because plants are rarely in need of uh, nutrients in that regard. 
Um, and if you remember, mycorrhizae need these relationships to complete their life cycle and persist in the soil longer than a growing season or two. So deprive, what we're doing in the end is depriving many of our farmlands from the expansive benefits to ecosystem health and stability that mycorrhizae provide, as well as the, um, the, the soil health and erosion prevention uh, that they can provide as well. And additionally, many of the crops we grow now have been bred, uh, haven't been bred with these relationships in mind. Instead, they've been bred for use alongside those fertilizers that I was mentioning um, that actively reduce the need for mycorrhizal associations. So what this does now is it puts us in a position where we can begin to utilize our plants fungal friends to approach more sustainable agricultural practices. And this can happen in a few ways. Uh, the first and easiest is literally just applying <laughs> mycorrhizae whenever you're growing plants. You might have seen mycorrhizal inoculants in your, gardening so in your gardening soil. So if you've ever seen and looked on the back of your bag and seen something like glomulus intraradices, that's actually uh, one of the most common mycorrhizal species. It's actually the one I study, um, fun fact. And that's something that uh, you as a gardener can buy. Also farmers can even buy large jugs of inoculant to coat their seeds during planting. And just by applying this, you can improve uh, yield, I'm sorry, <clears throat> excuse me, you can improve yield, you can improve plant, uh, general plant growth and health, as well as reducing your need for applying fertilizers uh, throughout the growing season. Also, we can use things like mycorrhizal mindful practices, certain crop rotations, for example, that allow mycorrhizae to persist and proliferate in the soil, setting the foundation for continued improvement of health and erosion reduction. Um, and then in a longer term speaking down the road, there are breeding and engineering opportunities to improve the fungal association of a crop species um, with different management systems in mind. The unfortunate part of this is it's gonna probably take a while. Conventional breeding approaches can take several years at least before coming close to being available on the agricultural market. And more precise genetic engineering requires pretty intimate knowledge at the molecular level, like the research I'm trying to do. Uh, and many other researchers are trying to understand at this time. We have a decent idea, but nowhere close uh, to begin to really go about engineering a plant with all of the important questions we need in mind, like what is it gonna do to the surrounding environment? How does this affect the crop in the long run? How does this affect the uh, mycorrhizae in the long run, et cetera? And you know, in addition to these approaches, uh, there are also exciting questions about mycorrhizae's role in um, already more sustainable approaches, such as regenerative agriculture and permaculture that are a little closer to natural ecosystems. I personally am very excited to learn more about how mycorrhizae support these practices and where there are places that uh, we can use our knowledge of these systems to improve their support and kind of uh, optimize uh, their use in these uh, growth setups. And so closing out my talk, I want to give you a few big takeaways. The first being that there is power in community. By working together, plants and fungi have dramatically shaped the earth as we know it. Uh, they form stable foundations for thriving ecosystems and challenge much of what we understood about either party, plant or fungal, with this relationship. Without it, it's difficult to know if plants would have even taken to land, starting the long chain of reactions that allows us to be here today. Next is that nature is intelligent and extremely interconnected. These relationships require complex communication and analysis between entirely different kingdoms of life and have rippling effects through the ecosystems that we're just now beginning to understand. My favorite part of doing research on this topic is the frequent reminder, like weekly, uh, that many things we consider special markers of intelligence, like trade negotiations or caring for those around you or um, you know, perceiving the little things around our environment can be found all around us, even right beneath our feet. And finally, the more that we understand about this community that is nature, the better we can support and be a part of it. Nature is intimately interconnected. Understanding how it all meshes together can allow us to grow with our natural environment, not at the expense of it. Whether we're simply appreciating and respecting what it provides for us or innovating new approaches and technologies. After all, 
Plants and fungi have been working together to grow plants and support habitats for many millions of years longer than humans have even begun trying their hand at it. Perhaps it's time we took some lessons from our elders. And with that, I wanna thank you so much for your time and very briefly give an acknowledgement for the funding that allows me to do this research and allows me to get my education here at UC Berkeley. Of course, my department, um, the National Science Foundation, the lab that I work in, the Joint Bioenergy Institute, as well as the organizations that support my collaborators, Enroot and uh, Nova Nordisk Foundation. And so that's my talk. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Lorenzo. Um, I'm never gonna look at a mushroom or a tree the same way again, actually. Um, there's some very interesting points and concepts you brought up and we have a ton of questions from the community. So I'm gonna get to those in a second. Um, um, for those of you who are unable to stay online, you can keep engaged with the Land Trust by following our various social media accounts or visiting our website at sonomalandtrust.org where we list upcoming events Sonoma Land Trust is a nonprofit organization, which means we rely on donations from individual businesses, uh, individuals, businesses, and foundations to make our work possible. To make a donation online at Sonoma Land Trust, visit sonomalandtrust.org and click on the donate button. So Lorenzo, one of the first questions I have before we get to a lot of the questions from the community, um, you mentioned um, the fossil record shows that there this interaction was happening early on and it may have played into plants coming on land. Can you expand on that just a little bit? Yes, so uh, I think the fact that we even managed to find a fossil is just like extremely lucky, right? Fungi don't have bones. They're made of like very fleshy structures and ancient plants were similarly quite small, didn't have a lot of really hardy tissues. Um, but we are fortunate in that uh, we have essentially microscopic fossils. And in these microscopic fossils, researchers found uh, structures that actually look a hell of a lot like an arbuscule. And that's, that's a pretty unmistakable thing to see uh, at a microscopic scale. Um, and then to support that, uh, other research that has been done has shown that um, plants uh, and lichens and, and whatnot, other things that are genetically very similar to uh, very simple plants, very very similar to plants when they first came onto land, are able to kind of make the transcriptional changes and genetic uh, kind of rewrites of their genes that are required, that would be required to give resources to the fungus um, and actually receive things in return. As far as the ectomycorrhizae, uh, I think it's like they found tree fossils that had very obvious uh, morphological traits. Um, and fortunately for us, uh, the general structure and form of this relationship has remained pretty unchanged um, for a very long time. Um, so um, is the AM mycorrhizal the same as BAM? Uh, yes, so um, in the last like 20 years, there's been a lot of changes uh, to the to terminology we use is like we find out more information or kind of realize that uh, it's a bit of a mouthful or like changing categories. But yeah, uh, VAM, if you're reading something, vesicular or muscular mycorrhizal fungi are the same as our muscular mycorrhizal fungi. Okay. And did the AMs evolve only once or are there parts of the same clad? How does this come together? So our muscular mycorrhizae are actually believed to, to my understanding, to only have been evolved once. Every arbuscular mycorrhizal species we know is present under the same clade uh, or same uh, family, glomera mycota. Um, and yeah, it's different for ectomycorrhizae. We see multiple different species or clades that have the ability to do this. But in the case of AM, it's, it's like this happened once and then they just kind of kept going from there. <laughs> All right. So I've got several questions that kind of relate to fire. Um, <laughs> you know, that's a big issue for us here in the West. When the fires come through, does it completely wipe out the the, the networks? Uh, are the networks able to just to pull back together, or do they need to be reseeded? What happens there? 
So uh, I I'm, admit I'm definitely not an expert on this, but what I can tell you, uh, unfortunately, I know some people that uh, study fungal communities after uh, fire uh, in the forest, um, that usually uh, when a fire, uh, a wildfire comes through, it's about the first few centimeters uh, in the soil that actually heat up. Soil is a pretty good insulator. So when you get a little further down, um, you don't actually get to temperatures that would really kill most of the things we see there. Um, the caveat being further down, there's less nutrients, less oxygen. So the communities are very different from what you would see up top. Um, most of uh, mycorrhizal species are gonna get pretty burnt <laughs> by a, a large scale wildfire. Um, and if they don't, uh, a lot of their hosts probably did as well. Um, so at the very least, you're gonna see a severe reduction um, in the, the kind of density of these relationships going on. Um, so much so that like it'll probably take a while for it to get back to what it was just because it's going to take a while for the plant density to increase um, as well as them to continue producing spores and, and kind of reseeding that area like you said. Mm -hmm. And um, the other question kind of did around with drought. Are you noticing more association happening when droughts are, are on or how does it affect the whole network? So in the case of drought, it's actually a bit of a fine line. Um, so micro, as has been uh, now experimentally demonstrated, uh, this paper does have yet to go through peer review that I mentioned. Um, uh, it's just a preprint at, time, at the time, but as now has been demonstrated, uh, our muscular earth, mycorrhizal fungi do facilitate water uptake. So plants do want them uh, to help with that process, right? They extend way beyond what root systems can do. However, this does come at a cost. Right, similar to how we have to pay a water bill. <laughs> and sometimes you can't afford that water bill uh, or the, the food bill. And so they shut that service off. Um, and so plants that are undergoing extreme drought, so much so that they aren't able to, uh, they're kind of starting to run into their emergency reserves and they're finding it hard um, to keep things going, might have to uh, kind of shut the mycorrhizae out because it, it wants more than they can provide it. Um, and uh, when you reintroduce water to that situation very quickly, the plant goes, all right, cool, come back, come back. <laughs> I, I can do it again. Um, but uh, in extreme cases of drought, we do see this relationship kind of recede. Okay. And one other question kind of along um, the interaction in the network is, you know, with pecan trees where they send a drop all at once, and that's all at once. Is that a tie to the the interaction in this network or is that something you know where the network helps the trees to all know when to drop at the same time or is that something else different um that's likely a bit different i think that just has to do with trees uh or the the plant the pecan tree in this case um having a really good sense of like what the seasonal uh environmental conditions are um now they're definitely uh, could be the potential that these mycorrhizae relationships are contributing to that i just don't know of any direct evidence uh, that's been proven so far. Okay. And what is exactly your current research right now? So my research right now is concerned with that uh, kind of intimate communication process. Um, so we know some of the chemical signals involved, right? We know uh, some of the important genetic players, but there's still a lot of blank spaces. We don't really know all of the things that are important uh, for this conversation, right? We don't know like oh, if the cell wall is suddenly made up of different sugars, or if we're seeing different um, types of fats in, our, in the plasma membrane, how does this affect uh, this communication and this kind of um, monitoring process that happens between the two? And so that's where my research is. I'm um, taking plants that have been uh, uh, modified uh, genetically um, through like, you know, old school transposon mechanisms um, to kind of shut down certain genes. And so theoretically speaking, we should see different cell wall comp, uh, compositions, sugar should be different, certain fats shouldn't be present in the membrane anymore. Um, and then I'm taking these and, uh, you know, putting them with the mycorrhizae in a growth uh, setup, um, sometimes co-inoculating with different bacterial species, uh, depending on my question. Um, but I'm really trying to see if those mutants have any sort of difference? Do they associate with these less? Do they associate with these more? Do they associate with them the same, but don't trade the resources mm -hmm. as much, right? Okay. And so along the lines, you were talking to show the agriculture. Um, with root vegetables, 
do you know what their relationship is to the wood wide web? Uh, yeah, so root vegetables like carrots and beets and whatnot are capable of forming um, arbuscular mycorrhizal relationships. Uh, I don't know of any root veggies that can form ectomycorrhizal relationships. Um, but uh, yeah, they, uh, they don't form them like in the main tuber that we eat uh, because that's mostly a storage uh, spot. So they'll form them in all the little lateral uh, fine roots that come off. Um, and so in a, uh, for example, your garden um, or like another kind of uh, uh, setup where maybe you have a lot of different uh, plant species growing alongside each other, um, you could actually end up getting a, a pretty nice little network of mycorrhizae forming between your plants, um, helping each other uh, in this situation. So then what we want to, you know, a lot of gardeners have to rotate vegetables um, as they go with the seasons. Would the tilling and all that be a concern in, in breaking up these networks, or does that actually help the network? Um, so tilling uh, can break these networks up. These mycorrhizae are very fine, uh, extremely easy to break, like so much so the, uh, those mycoheterotrophs I showed you, you can literally just like pull them out of the soil because <laughs> they don't have roots. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so like if you go in and just like turn up all of your soil, you're breaking all the connections that were made or at least most of them. And they have to reform those. Um, um, you also could be helping spread spores. On the other hand, uh, I think I remember I was seeing a researcher talk and they said that they saw a massive bloom in aerial uh, mycorrhizae spore counts. And they were like, what's going on here? And then they thought about it longer. They're like, oh, it's harvesting season in the Midwest. Uh, <laughs> and so everyone's digging up their field and then we just all gets tossed into the atmosphere. Um, but yeah, you will uh, kind of affect the, the network composition, who's connected to who. Um, you're not necessarily killing the fungus, um, but you're definitely kind of slowing it down a bit. Mm -hmm. And speaking of spores, is that kind of a year round, uh, they're produced year round, or is there like seasons for the different spores that are being produced? Uh, it is seasonal in some regards. I think it's more so just when the environment is right. Um, so uh, like, our ectomycorrhizal species right there, just looking for a nice, warm, moist spot uh, to grow a mushroom in. Um, so you'll usually find them at the base of trees, uh, you know, underneath the leaf litter a little bit, um, tucked away. Uh, as far as our, our muscular mycorrhizal friends, uh, they just form spores and they just get kind of stay in the soil. Um, and so because they're already underground, um, to my knowledge, there isn't like heavy seasonality to that. It's just more, do they have enough resources to do so? do they think that the environment is uh, appropriate to do this? Mm -hmm. And is there a way that, you know, we can help foster the, the mycorrhizae in our, like our, in our gardens? Is there something we should do other than just simply like you mentioned with the fertilizer? Yeah, so, um, you know, definitely like get an inoculant. Um, getting an inoculant can help. A lot of soils will probably have some kind of mycorrhizae anyways, but like hard to tell if it's something that's gonna wanna associate with your plants. Um, but yeah, it comes down to like not using uh, or using very limited amounts of fertilizer. Um, and if you want to get really intense about it, uh, you can like look up, um, uh, which I guess this is maybe more important um, in like a forest context, but you can look up kind of which um, plants are really good for this kind of relationship. Um, and so uh, you can do things like when you're rotating your season uh, of your garden, you can be like, okay, I had ones that kind of take more. Um, from this network, they, they're bigger takers. So I want to plant something that's maybe going to give a little bit more back to these mycorrhizae um, and help them stick around more um, between seasons and whatnot. Um, but that's something that like, there's definitely more research that needs to go into that. I think a lot of our research now, uh, we're not quite at that level of detail um, in some regards, uh, especially in like a personal gardening sense. Um, I'm hoping that like in the next 10 to 20 years, we really get on that um, and, and people really start to figure out uh, these, in some cases, smaller questions, but that have a lot of like very direct impact to people outside of the scientific sphere. Mm -hmm. And I'm still um, kind of circle back to the fires because I've got a couple more questions about fires. Um, and one of the questions was, you know, can you say more about the impact of fires on the microbial network? And, you know, fires can smolder for weeks before the fire is completely extinguished. And, is there more about the resilience of fungi in those areas? 
I'm I'm not too sure on that. Uh, I mean, uh, again, aside from the fact that if, if they are extended further down into the soil, they they do benefit uh, from a lot of pretty pretty good insulation. Um, but again, it's also like dependent on on how well their hosts in the area uh, survive because if all of their potential hosts die off, uh, there's no way for them to get those. They they have no mechanism for making food themselves, so. Uh, they wouldn't be able to stick around for much longer. They might go dormant into spores and wait until new hosts come around, but they'll they'll go dormant for a bit at least. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, networks in the urban forest. You know, are you seeing a lot more with the networks there, or are you mostly focused on you know the large forest areas? Um, I'm not too sure about like differences between them. I know that they're probably there. Uh, like it's just that they're going to be a bit limited in their extensiveness because urban forests tend to be quite small or segmented uh and as as much as we do see them extend out right i don't know how well uh of mycorrhizal species can like go through a few city blocks trying to get <laughs> certain <laughs> like the two or three trees maybe in the area hooked up to it so, right but then in that case it would also need to be trees of similar type or can they be different trees uh, depends on the mycorrhizal species. Ectomycorrhizae are a little more particular. Uh, so um, yeah, if it's going to be like, like if you have like a pine tree, it might not be able to just hook up to like a, uh, like a fig tree around the corner or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. As far as like arbuscular, which again, most plants can make, uh, they're a lot less picky. So, but they also do end up giving a few uh, on a large scale, they do end up giving a, a little bit less uh, to their hosts. And, take right. more. and so speaking of trees, there's, you know, the question around tree farms and, and continuing logging and practices with this, how does that kind of affect the network? And is there kind of a need to leave, you know, the, the mother trees intact? Yeah, so I, that's, um, I definitely, uh, again, uh, is not an area of expertise uh, for me, but what I do understand about it is um, like I mentioned uh, back on the, the network slide uh, the, where I showed the maps that have the nodes and whatnot, you know, the larger older trees very frequently tend to have uh, much more extensive network connections, like, like way, way more. They're kind of like the, the hubs of the network. And so if you're coming in as a logger and you're like, oh, I'm going to cut down this big tree because all these younger ones will grow up and then I get all this logging, um, you're changing the dynamics of that network. You might not be cutting those ties. Um, because the roots, depending on how you do it, right, the roots of the tree can stay around for quite a while and it's still alive in some senses and it's still hooked up to the network. The difference being now that maybe all those trees are putting resources to keep this stump alive um, instead of this, that tree giving resources to the rest of the forest. And so um, I do know that there are kind of a bit of a shift in some forest practices where people will kind of leave what they think uh, are these like mother trees, these hub trees around to help um, keep the forest nice and stable and healthy and they harvest kind of the intermediate trees or something like that in the meantime. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask a question that's kind of, I'm going to read this one almost verbatim because it's actually an interesting question. Um, and it says, uh, humans invented the internet and pretty much immediately started using it for sex, not just trade. <laughs> Given that this network has existed for hundreds of millions of years and evolution would favor any reproductive advantage, have plants slash fungi been using this network for reproduction and not just trade? I am not too sure. I don't, I think most plants would not be able to use this reproduction simply because of like that they're having to pass something through the fungi and it's usually not specific what they're like who could be at the other end of that network, right? Um, and, you know, different species of plant aren't very compatible in some regards uh, to reproduction. However, I think that's an interesting question from like a myco heterotroph perspective. These plants that have kind of entirely dedicated themselves to the, the, the network for better or worse. I'm not familiar with their reproductive strategies, but um, I think that's an interesting uh, research question. If, if we haven't already proven that inc incorrect, it could be cool. <laughs> Some cool answers uh, to that question. Okay. Um, another question is about um, uh, fungi lending sugar to trees in winter and getting paid back in the spring. Can that be, is that confirmed or your thoughts on that? 
So it's, it's as far as like the lending and the payback, um, I think that's, uh, that example was given more in the context of like two individual trees, where you can think about it as like uh, a source sink situation. So one tree has more sugars to give to the network. And so as a result, uh, it pours out into the network and the tree that has less of them ends up getting more to bring it to an equilibrium. As far as fungi themselves, uh, usually they'll want their payment uh, in exchange. Um, they, they don't like getting denied it very long because they need it to survive. So um, it's pretty hard for them unless they have a pretty established network uh, to kind of go without for a while. Um, but like I said, uh, we can see like favoritism for lack of a better word. Um, so theoretically speaking, uh, it might not be unrealistic to think that uh, the fungi could provide resources sort of pro bono or near pro bono to a particular host or group of hosts um, because they know that they'll be able to survive without it. And then later down the road, when they know when these hosts are really productive, they reap the benefits. Um, the issues with this is that's very hard uh, to study uh, experimentally um, and is pretty labor intensive, but uh, there are some really, really talented researchers out there um, working on these questions right now. So, mm -hmm. And um, speaking of that, in a way, um, on your map showing the world and showing some of the different networks, you know, there were some areas like the deserts that didn't really show. Mm -hmm. And like Chile was another example of um, an area that did not seem to have a big network. Is that lack of data or is that really actual? Yeah, so it's a bit of a, a lack of data. Um, so uh, I, I don't know if I emphasize that these are just forest networks um, or predicted forest networks. Um, and uh, all of the data, or a good majority of the data that they used to predict these were from uh, the uh, European continent as well as uh, North American continent um, with a little bit of, of like, um, I think mainland China, they had some data points as well. Um, and so like in the case of Africa and South America, a lot of it is a, a bit inferred. Um, and, and I'm sorry, not South, not parts of South America, because they did take uh, samples in the Amazon. Um, but this doesn't include like uh, grasslands, uh, for example, which we would likely see networks. They're probably going to be arbuscular because um, grasses really don't make ectomycorrhizal relationships. Um, and they also don't include like the more mixed environments that you maybe wouldn't consider a woodland or a forest. Um, and so, yeah, it's kind of a, a lack of data, not really the question that they were uh, trying to answer with this map. Okay, I've got about five more questions, but before I get to those, I want to make sure if people wanted to reach you after this presentation, is there a Twitter or a email or how did you want to be um, contacted? Uh, yeah, uh, you can email me at uh, Lorenzo underscore W at birthday.edu. Put that in the chat real quick. Um, that is my institutional email. And I will usually respond uh, within a day or two, depending on what my life looks like at the moment. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, you can reach me there. I do also have, um, I have like a, a Twitter, uh, but it's like a mix of science and personal. So occasionally I'll put some science stuff out. Occasionally it's um, just me tweeting um, about like what grad school can be. And do, 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 that is at swanky kind of guy. All right. So um, kind of back to the, um, the sex question a little bit there, breakups between fungi and trees, you know, they've been in a great relationship, all of a sudden there's a breakup. Is that a breakup on that tree level or is it gonna be like a community wide level? And it's, how does that affect, you know, the mother tree versus baby tree? So uh, again, you know, it kind of depends on why they're breaking up. Um, usually I think it's more so at a uh, personal, level, um, you're going to see, oh, I see. One sec. I just saw a comment. I did not send those to everyone. One second. Thank you, Jay, for correcting that. Um, anyways, back to the question. So uh, these breakups usually will occur, I think, more on an individual level. It's kind of that, that breakdown of like, hey, I'm paying you too much, or you're not paying me enough, or like, you're too sick. I don't want to do this anymore. You're probably going to die soon, anyways. I have other options, um, and you know that 
is mostly going to just affect whoever the breakup was from. Um, but again, this can go either way, right? The plant can be like, hey, I want you out now. Uh, and the fungus doesn't really have a choice in the matter a lot of times. They don't have, I don't think, very robust ways to uh, combat the immune system like some of their more pathogenic cousins do. Um, and on the, the larger community scale in say a, like a catastrophic event, like a toxic spill or like a fire coming through, cutting out most of the network, right? Um, the fungus not being able to provide these resources uh, that it normally would need to might have to call back uh, the network a bit um, and kind of regroup if it's still alive. Um, and so because of this, right, it's cutting out maybe a lot more of the community than it would. So if you're in a situation or in, a, in an area where the network isn't as extensive and there aren't as uh, uh, as a as diverse uh, members of the group kind of connecting with these trees at any given time, um, there could be some large scale community uh, issues with that, right? The plants might be a little more on their own now. They might have to put more investment into expanding their root systems until more mycorrhizae come along um, and forming up those networks. And in forming out those networks, you know, if you're planning a new garden area, new landscaping, and you don't have those older trees already in existence, is there a best plan to try and kind of partner plants to help establish connections? Uh, from a tree standpoint, I think you can definitely kind of go in and be like, okay, we got like, we know that these trees are within a particular host range or like, you know, like we'll see these mycorrhizal species maybe coming in. Um, particularly if you're in temperate areas where there's already, um, you know, these forests uh, and connections not far away. Uh, from an arbuscular standpoint, um, they're pretty generalist. Uh, so it's really, it's just kind of comes down to that management and inoculation and you just let nature kind of take its course. These, these guys have been doing this for quite a while. So humans right. sit back and, and relax in some cases. Mm -hmm. And with these networks, how, how is the sampling done to try and locate these networks and see what the connectivity of them is? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? The yeah, so, um, sorry. Um, in the networks, when you're doing your sampling to find the networks and where they're connected, how is that done? Yeah, so uh, like with, if I go back to this map, uh, these researchers uh, kind of came up with this map uh, pretty cleverly, honestly. Uh, what they did was they took um, soil core samples. So they, they went down and, and took samples of, uh, I forget how deep it was, but uh, pretty good ways into the soil. Um, uh, I think it was uh, a meter or so outside of the rain drop. So like the edge of the canopy of trees um, all around the forest. And so the idea being that in these soil cores, they've gotten small fibrous roots of the tree that they're sampling from, as well as any potential mycorrhizal species that would be associated uh, with these roots. And they then took those uh, soil samples back, um, extracted DNA from them, uh, and then sequenced that DNA. And through the sequencing, uh, they could, there are different strategies where you don't have to sequence really large bits, you can only sequence small bits and kind of attribute those to different species or like a fungus versus a tree, for example. Um, and so they, they took all of their sequencing data and then began to parse it out. And once they parsed it out, they could see that, oh, uh, you know, where we selected from here under this tree, we see this many different mycorrhizal types. And we sampled under this tree and we also see those mycorrhizal types, plus a few more. We go over here, we don't see any of those mycorrhizal types. Uh, at all, but we see new ones. Um, and, you know, if you do this enough times, you can start to really infer what's going on. I forget the exact number, um, but they were probably out there for quite a while. Taking <laughs> uh, they, they, they did quite an exhaustive job. So. Mm -hmm. And can trees use the network to repeal others? Like, for example, black walnuts. You know, they say black walnuts produce a substance that repeals competitors. Um, is this kind of, you know, what they can, can they use this network? And is that kind of true? Uh, I mean, yeah, there was a, like the, the, the study that I showed, the walnut tree was sending those toxins out. Um, and it, it does have an, the, the, in the research study that they did that, they showed that it did have a negative impact on uh, nearby plants uh, for their growth. This wasn't ex like an experimental, so a greenhouse type situation. It wasn't like naturally in the environment. So you know, there could be caveats in that phase out, um, but that potential is there. And, you know, there is also that um, 
kind of like competing networks uh, thing I, I mentioned where you can have a tree like a eucalyptus tree who's a little more particular about what kind of ectomycorrhizae it wants to associate with that maybe isn't found a lot in this environment. And when it shows up with that ectomycorrhizae, they might be a little more effective at getting nutrients or crowding out the hosts. And so kind of through working together, they eventually crowd out these other networks, outcompete them um, and take their space. Okay. And back to kind of to, you know, that spore cloud in the Midwest during the, the harvesting, is that something that can be a dangerous to, you know, to humans or to um, other mammals causing infections? Is that something we should worry about? So I don't think it would cause infections. To my understanding, we haven't, there hasn't been like any documented cases of uh, like a, a human allergic reaction to these things. Um, actually, this is something that's pretty recent. I think the researcher I was, uh, the presentation where I found this out about, they did this study, like they, they found this out, I think like within the last three years, they're like, oh shit, <laughs> look at this uh, new thing we saw. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's still kind of new. So I, I don't know, you know, if like, maybe there is some sort of seasonal allergies related to just sheer spore count. If you happen to live in a place where a lot of this is happening, um, but I don't think we can definitively say just yet. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to throw in the spot with one big picture. How do you see your field of research benefiting society as a whole going forward? Hmm. How do I see my field of research benefiting society as a whole? So I got two prongs to my answer. One being, I think, uh, kind of back to my big takeaways just the more we understand about how tree or how plants in general and fungi in general make these relationships, the more we can appreciate kind of just how intelligent and how interconnected everything is, it can inform how we operate, right? If we actually act on our knowledge in that sense. And, um, you know, if we find out how these dynamics work, we can change our practices and our approaches where applicable um, to work with these relationships and kind of work with the environment as it goes instead of fighting against it. Or maybe, oh, we were trying to do something good, but we just didn't know about this and it ends up that it was really bad for it or it didn't work because we didn't think of this. Um, and so that's one level. Uh, the second is uh, when it comes to the agricultural setup, uh, you know, our modern agriculture system is needs a lot of work uh, to get to a place where we can actually feed everyone and have it not be a consistent and uh, large scale issue. And I think that, you know, really bringing back, trying to bring back modern agriculture to that like community centric standpoint where we're thinking about more than just the plant and how much food we can get out of it. We're thinking about the plant, we're thinking about the soil we're growing it in, we're thinking about the, the microbes that are growing in that soil, growing on and in the plant, insects, all that. We're thinking about the whole community dynamic. Um, we can really start to like make food on large scales without damaging these things. We can do them actually easier in some respects, right? Like plants and plants were growing by them, like without the use of fertilizer uh, or directly, like we had, you know, different ways to fertilize, but they were growing to, to, to good proportions before we started doing these modern uh, breeding practices and putting this fertilizer out there. So we just got to get ourselves back to that. And with our new tools and understanding of this process at a molecular level, we can expand it out to an ecosystem one and, and to a, one that's applied and uh, actually useful in these contexts. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Lorenzo, Lorenzo, thank you so much for your presentation and talk. I'd like to thank all of our um, participants tonight for attending. If you enjoyed the webinar, please consider donating. Your gifts help support land protection and preservation. To make a donation online at Sonoma Land Trust, visit sonomalandtrust.org and click the donate button. You can view some of our past presentations and download educational material on our Nature at Home page on our website. And it was mentioned earlier that this presentation will be uploaded to our YouTube channel later. Um, and you can find those past presentations at sonomalandtrust.org, Nature at Home. Well, sadly, that's all the time we have for tonight. I'd like to thank everyone for attending. Thank you, Lorenzo, for the presentation. Thank you, everyone, for attending. We at the Sonoma Land Trust appreciate everyone who is supporting our work in these uncertain times. Thank you, everyone, and good night. <laughs>